What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. Everything is meaningless. Completely meaningless. So what's the purpose? Good morning. Take your Bibles with me to a, and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Today we, we conclude our series on the book of Ecclesiastes. And, and I must confess, I, I conclude it today with a little bit of mixed feelings. Um, I'm excited about our, our new series that we're going to be starting in the next few weeks. Our, our new series is called The Carols of Christmas, and uh, you'll enjoy it as we dig into the biblical meaning of some of our most loved Christmas carols, and, and we'll start that in just a few weeks. But, but I'm a little saddened to be ending this series because, uh, because uh, this book has touched my life. And I trust that it's, tr that it's touched your life as well. The book of Ecclesiastes has proven to be so very practical. It always amazes me how a, uh, how a book that was written some 3,000 years ago is so relevant to our lives today. Yet that certainly has been the case, and I've appreciated so very much uh, your comments to me, kind of sharing with me uh, uh, how God has used this study in your life. Here's just a few things that God has taught me uh, as we've walked through the book of Ecclesiastes. Let me mention them by way of introduction today, and these are some of these things are things that we have already studied, but the first thing is this, nothing in this life will provide you with the ultimate joy and satisfaction that God desires to give you. We've seen that repeatedly throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. Nothing satisfies, not wisdom, not wealth, as Solomon mentioned, not women, not success. Solomon has repeatedly said that there is nothing new under the sun and that everything under the sun is vanity. It's all meaningless. We began the series with that quote from C.S. Lewis in which he said, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the only explanation is that I was made for another world. And I trust that you've been able to walk away with the series realizing that you were made not for this world, but that you and I were made for another world. Here's the second thing that I've learned. I've learned this, that, that my life and your life is a mixture of blessings and burdens. As we came to chapter 3, you'll remember that Solomon said there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. There's a time to laugh and there's a time to cry. Life is filled with blessings and life is also filled with burdens. We need to accept both and we need to learn to trust God no matter what happens in our life. I trust that you've learned that through the series. The third thing that I wrote down is this. God has designed us to live life together. Remember Solomon said it this way in, in chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. He said, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who falls alone and doesn't have a brother to lift him up. You and I were created to worship God together. That is why Sunday mornings uh, are so important as, as we meet together with God's family for us to be encouraged as a family. The fourth thing that I wrote down is this, you and I were created for worship. What a simple yet profound truth. 
We were created for worship. God didn't create us so that we could be successful. God didn't create us so that we could necessarily build families or have fun. Now, he graciously allows us to do all of those things. But we were created for the purpose of glorifying him through our lives. And and we never fulfill our purpose more than when we come together as a body and we worship the Lord. You see, he desires to occupy the place of importance in our lives. In chapter 5, Solomon said this, guard your steps when you go into the house of God. Be careful with your worship. Along those lines, the next thing is as believers, we need a fresh glimpse of who God is. And how he desires to be worshipped. God is awesome. Do you believe that this morning? God is awesome. God deserves our worship. No matter if he he saves us, if he blesses us, if he gives us what we need, or whether he doesn't. Worship is about him. It's not about us. The last thing that I wrote down is this. When you trust Jesus Christ, what you do is transformed to reflect who you are. What's the idea? That as Jesus Christ comes into our life, we, we ask him to be our Lord and Savior, and he, and he comes into our life. We receive him by faith. He begins to change us from the inside out, and our outward actions now begin to reflect the internal person that we are. Jesus is changing us. Let me ask you this morning, is Jesus changing you? Is your life different today than it was 12 months ago or or different than it was maybe even six months ago? Because little by little, you were allowing Jesus to occupy that, that, that throne in your life. And as you surrender your life to him, he is changing you from the inside out. Well, what a great study this has been. Well, today we're in the last few verses of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, beginning in verse 9, follow along as I read, I'll put it up on the screen. Solomon says this, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, they're like prods. And like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. Verse 13, the end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Let me read that again, so powerful. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Then he ends with a warning. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. What's the idea? You and I cannot hide anything from God. One day God will bring the light even the hidden works of darkness. Pray with me today. Father, I know we've had a lot jam-packed in our service this morning. But Lord, for the next few minutes, I pray that you'd calm our minds, calm our hearts, help us to understand the words of Solomon as he closes this, this relevant, this practical, this powerful book. Father, help us to realize what our purpose is in life. Father, how sad when a believer lives his or her entire life and doesn't fulfill their destiny, doesn't fulfill their purpose. Help us to see that in your word this morning. And as as we see it, I pray that we would be sensitive and submissive and obedient to the Holy Spirit of God. Thank you for what you're going to teach us today. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. See two things in the passage, two simple points. The first is this. We see the conclusion of Solomon's ministry. And then we see the conclusion of Solomon's message. The conclusion of his ministry is found in verses 9 through 12. Now, as we mentioned in last week's message, we believe that Ecclesiastes was written towards the end of Solomon's life. This book is a personal testimony of Solomon. You'll remember that early in his life, he was fervent, he was passionate, he was dedicated to God. And then as he married more and more wives, the Bible says that that those wives pulled his heart away from God. And for a, a period of time in Solomon's life, he, as the hymn says, wandered far away from God. There was a time in his life when he came back, when he realized the error of his ways, when he cried out to God for forgiveness, and when he returned to that passion and that fervency to worship the Lord. This book is his testimony stating, listen, it's not worth it to chase after the vain, meaningless things of life. There is only one thing that is worth chasing after, that's God and a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, Solomon is a testimony to the fact that God forgives sin and God gives a second and a third and a fourth chance. Aren't you grateful for that today? That after one mistake, God doesn't write you off and say, man, that's it. I'm done with you. God is a God of second, third, and fourth chances. And the book of Ecclesiastes is a testimony to that. Wherever you are in your life this morning, please know that God loves you. That's what we sang about today. God desperately loves you. He's ready to forgive, and he desires to use you again. We see that in Solomon's life, and we see that in the book of Ecclesiastes. Notice several things in this chapter. The first thing we see is this, the value of a wise teacher. In verse 9, he says once again, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs. These verses indicate that even up to the end of his life, Solomon had an effective ministry. God used his wisdom and his writing skills to impact the lives of others. And God continues to do that today because you and I have been impacted by the inspired words that Solomon wrote. Notice the diligence that Solomon demonstrated in his studies. Verse 9, he says this, Weighing, studying, and arranging the Proverbs with great care. Solomon sat down and penned uh, those inspired words, inspired words that we hold in our hand, whether in Ecclesiastes or the book of uh, Proverbs or even Song of Solomon. Solomon was diligent in his study of how he did that. Verse 10, he says this, the preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly he wrote the words of truth. Here's what that verse is simply saying. Although he desired for his words to be pleasing, although he desired for his words to be acceptable, he never compromised the truth. He was not afraid to say what needed to be said in his writing and in his teaching. He said all of that, once again, in Proverbs chapter 8, verses 6 through 9, Solomon had said this, Hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right, for my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight to him who understands, and right to those who find knowledge." Here's what Solomon says. There is tremendous value in finding a wise teacher. All of us, all of us need wise teachers and preachers in our lives that will not just tell us what we want to hear, but will tell us what we need to hear. As the New Testament says, someone who just won't scratch our ears and, 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 and make us feel good about ourselves. But someone will, that will tell us exactly what God's word says. The value of a wise teacher. He says, secondly, the value of wise words. Notice in verse 11, he says this, The words of the wise are like goads, 
And like nails that are firmly fixed are the collected sayings. Now, you and I aren't familiar with the goad, all right? I don't think, do we have any shepherds in our congregation? I don't think we have any shepherds in our congregation. That was a little bit of a joke. I didn't expect anybody to raise their hand. But uh, uh, shepherds during New Testament times would use something like a goad. Now, this isn't exactly a goad. This is a spear from Burkina Faso that, that Mike Rittering gave me. But, but it has the idea. This is a tool that, that, that you, know, you can use to dig on the one side, and the other side has a sharp edge. Well, well, shepherds would carry goads with them that would have sharp edges. And the purpose of the goad was to do this. It was just to prod the sheep along. Huh? Come on, Mike. I've been talking about getting your life right. Come on. Come on, Mike. All right? All right? And so the purpose of the goad would be to what? As the sheep were going, they were kind of headed in the right direction. The shepherd would take that goad and he would just kind of touch the sheep. And he would what? He would push the sheep back in the right direction to make sure that they wouldn't get lost, to make sure that they wouldn't stray away from the path on which they needed to be. We understand that. Here's what Solomon says. He says that the words of God, the words of wisdom are what? They are like goads. They're like cattle prods. They're like a pointed stick that pokes us and pushes us back in the right direction. Quite frankly, it didn't feel good. But without such goading, without such prodding, a sheep could easily wander off and get lost. Has there ever been a time in your life that you felt the prodding of the Word of God? Maybe someone was standing up speaking. Maybe you were just in the quietness of your home, and you were reading God's Word, and all of a sudden it was like, ouch, that hurts. The Word of God says something to you that, that for the moment hurts, but it what? It keeps you on the right path. The value of wise words. He makes a second illustration. He says, not only are they like goads or prods, but they are like nails that provide stability for our lives. Now, depending upon the translation, some translations translate it differently, but, but I think it means this. The word that Solomon used for nail is the generic word. There's, there's nothing special about it. Uh, the word nail, here's what it means. Are you ready? It means nail. That's exactly what it means. All right, there's nothing fancy about it. It's just a nail. It's the same word that's used for the golden nails that were put in the tabernacle and in the temple. And it's the word that's used for simple, generic nails that were used to build something or to stabilize something. What is Solomon saying? Solomon is saying that the words of God not only prod us in the right direction, but they provide stability for us. They, they strengthen us. They, they secure us. Have you ever experienced that in your life? Have you ever been going through a struggle in your life and it's like, oh my word, God, man, the, the winds of the storm just are, are beating me to death. And you grab a hold of a verse, a verse that you grab a hold of, and it's just like the stable nail that you hold on to until the storm passes by. Have you ever done that in your life? I've done that. I've told you of times that I've done that. The one night that I was in Mexico City and Vicki was in uh, Ohio and Amber almost died and she took Amber to the hospital and I struggled with God and I tried to find a verse and you know the, the Bible was just like reading words that I did not understand until I came to Psalm 37, 23 where it simply says this, the steps of a good man are established by God. And that night, I grabbed a hold of the nail of God's word and I held on. What I needed was something strong. I needed something secure. That's what Solomon says that the word of God is. The word of God prods us along. It hurts us at times. It does, but it pushes us in the right direction. And it's just like a nail, a nail that we can hold on to. He says a third thing. He talks about not only the value of a wise teacher, the value of wise words, <clears throat> but he talks about the value of recognizing the chief shepherd. 
Verse 11 is, is really interesting, and we don't have time to jump into the, the details of it, but he says this. Let me read it again so you get the context. The words of the wise are like goads and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd, capital S. These words are given by one shepherd. There's some debate as to whom Solomon is referring by the term shepherd. Some say why, obviously Solomon is referring to himself as, as, as the shepherd, as the king of Israel. He is the one that is guiding the sheep of Israel. But I believe that's extremely unlikely because every other time he refers to himself in the book of Ecclesiastes, he uses a different term. He uses the term the preacher or the teacher. Here he completely changes it. In verse 10, he talks about the preacher. But as he comes to verse 11, he says, these goads, these nails, these wise words are given by one shepherd. To whom is he referring. I believe with all of my heart that he most likely is speaking of God. In the New Testament, that phrase is used in reference to Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 5, 4, Jesus is described as the chief shepherd. So when Solomon sits back and says, boy, these words are given by one shepherd. What does that mean? Let me give you two words. I didn't put it in your outline, but let me give you two words. First of all, I believe it's a direct proof of inspiration. Inspiration, meaning that that these words come from God. Although the words are the result of Solomon's reflection, they came from God. Solomon was inspired to write them. 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16, all scripture is given by what? By inspiration of God. They are God-breathed. And Solomon says, man, these words that I have just given you, these 12 chapters, they come not just from me, but they come from the one true shepherd. These words are inspired. There's a second word that I would use that apply to us. It's the word illumination. Not only inspiration, but illumination. You see, it is so important for us to read God's word with the realization that we are reading words from the chief shepherd. It is God speaking to us. Psalm 119, 105 says this, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And church, I know most of you know this, and this might be Christianity 101 for many of us, but we need to realize today that God desires to speak to you. Not just on Sundays when we come to church, but tomorrow morning when you wake up, God desires to speak to you. He desires that his words be a light to illuminate your path, to give you and I the wisdom and the direction that we so desperately need. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. All of these collected sayings are given to us by one shepherd, none other than God himself. As we arrive at verse 12, it seems as though Solomon makes a negative statement. Uh, Students seem to love verse 12. Uh, In verse 12, he simply says this. He says, my son, beware of anything beyond these, of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Do I have any students here today that would say amen to that? Huh? Hey, hey, students, write that down. When mom and dad are making you study, pull out Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 12. Dad, this is a weariness to my flesh. Listen, the idea in the passage is not that of not studying. It's simply a warning, not for us to go beyond what God has written in his word. Don't permit man's books to rob you of God's wisdom. My man We could park there for a second because that is happening so much in our secular society. How many of our our young people are going off to secular universities and they are reading secular books and they're walking out of those universities no longer believing in God? 
That's why it's so important for us to know what we believe, to have those spiritual truths well-grounded and well-founded in our mind and in our hearts. Solomon says, man, as I conclude my ministry, that is what I have attempted to do. The conclusion of Solomon's ministry. But we see a second thing. We see the conclusion of Solomon's message. And and verses 13 and 14 are obviously two of the most well-known, two of the most popular verses in the book of Ecclesiastes. Once again, he says, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So as Solomon ends this study, what in the world are the final words? What is the final exhortation that Solomon is going to give to each and every one of us? What are his conclusions as to the meaning of life? Well, that phrase The end of the matter, all has been heard. Let me give that to you in different translations. The New King James says it this way. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. The NIV says it this way. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. The NLT says, now all has been heard. Here, once again, is the conclusion. So here's what Solomon is saying. The study that we've done, this pursuit that we have been on, chasing after, trying to find out satisfaction, trying to find meaning, trying to find purpose. What is life all about? Solomon says, here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Here is the conclusion that I've come to. And he summarizes his conclusion with two succinct statements. The first thing he says is this, you must fear God. Verse 13, fear God and keep his commandments. If you know much about scripture, you know that the command to fear God is found all throughout the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12, and now O Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God? Psalm 19.9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 2, and do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body and hell. So Solomon says, man, here, here's where it is. Final words, fear God. So let's ask ourselves this morning, what does it mean to fear God? When Solomon exhorts us to do that, what does that mean? Martin Luther, one of the the great church fathers, struggled with that. You know, struggled trying to understand what it actually means to fear God. And he came up with this conclusion. He was the first one to make the distinction between what is called servile fear and filial fear. The fear of a servant or the fear of a family member. Here's the conclusion Martin Luther came to, and I like it. He said, we should fear God not as a prisoner fears his jailer, but as a son fears his father. Think about that for just a second. We should fear God, not as a prisoner fears his jailer. The prisoner is terrified of the jailer. Why? Because the jailer beats him. The jailer, at least, hopefully not in this day and age, but but at least during that time, tortured them and treated them wrongly. The idea is not that we have this terror of God, that we fear him as a prisoner, but rather we fear him as a child fears his father. What a great description of how you and I should fear God. We fear God not because we're afraid of torture or punishment. To the contrary, God is our source of security. God is our source of love. Therefore, our greatest fear is that of offending, that of displeasing the most important person in our life. 
Let me try to explain fear in a practical way because I think so many times we don't get what it means to fear God. And, and we go through moments in our life when we're terrorized of Him and we go through moments in our life where we kind of ignore Him and we kind of go back and forth. Let me give you an acrostic that might help us to understand today what it means to fear God, okay? The first is the letter F. I put this. F means faith in His sovereignty. What does that mean? I recognize God for who he truly is. Who is God? He's sovereign. He's king. He is Lord. You completely and unreservedly place your faith in him. Let me ask you today, do you believe this morning that God's in control? Let me ask you again, do you really believe that God is in control? control. Now, now we say that when the refrigerator's full and when there's money to pay the bills. But it's difficult for us to believe that when we have more bills than we have money, when there's hunger pains and we don't have the money to go to the grocery store, there's struggles. The doctor has said, I got bad news for you. It's at those moments that we struggle with trusting in God's sovereignty. But fearing God is this reverential trust in Him. I have faith in His sovereignty. What does that mean? God always does what is right. And I trust Him. F, I have faith in His sovereignty. E, I've experienced His grace. I've experienced his grace. I love this because your reverential trust for him is not only based upon who he is, but it's based upon what he has done for you. Anybody here this morning experience the grace of God? We all have. Did you wake up this morning? That's a demonstration of God's grace. Do you have a roof over your head? That's a demonstration of God's grace. Is there somebody in your life that recently told you that they love you? That's a miracle is what that is, but it's a demonstration of God's grace. On a daily basis, we experience what? We experience His grace in our lives, His mercy and His grace. His mercy is He doesn't give us what we do deserve. His grace is that He gives us what we could never, ever, ever deserve. And I experience His grace, and it causes me to trust more in Him. A, I'm awed by His majesty. I'm awed by His majesty. It is so easy for us to take or to mistake the extraordinary for the ordinary. Like the sons of Eli, we take the holiness of God for granted. Let me ask you this morning, when was the last time that you were awed by his majesty? Like Isaiah in the Old Testament or John in the book of Revelation, you saw God in all of his glory, in all of his holiness, and you were awed by who he is. You see, it's impossible for, it's impossible for us to truly fear God if we fail to see him as he truly is. Our we're resolved to do his will. We're resolved to do his will. Your love and your fear for him move you and I to do what he tells us to do. And that leads us to the second part of Solomon's exhortation. He says, here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. And what's the second thing he says? Obey his commandments. It's really interesting. In verse 3, there's two words that are emphasized in the Hebrew. The two words are God and commandments. This is the only time in the book of Ecclesiastes that the commands of God are mentioned. And notice the logical order that Solomon gives. He says this, fear or trust precedes obedience. That's significant because Solomon comes to realize that life only makes sense when we come to do what God asks of us. That's why repeatedly throughout the New Testament, he, he joins together love and obeying his commands. Luke 6, 46, Jesus asked this question, 
Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you to do? What a great question. Why do you call me Lord, but you don't do what I ask you to do? Jesus is saying, man, in your words, you're worshiping me, but in your actions, you're doing whatever you want to do. A couple thoughts about our obedience to his command. The first is this. Your obedience to him is given out of love and not out of legalism. What's the idea? We obey him because we love him. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Your obedience to him is given out of love and not legalism. The other thing is this, your obedience is given to him as a result of your worship. True worship leads to obedience. You see, reverential fear trust leads to worship which in turn results in obedience. Our conduct stems from worship. There are way too many, and this is a, a topic that we don't have time to get into today. There are way too many believers today that obey God, but their motives are wrong. They obey the Lord out of legalism. They obey the Lord out of fear. And God doesn't want us to obey him out of fear. God desires for us to obey him because we love him because we worship him, because he is the most important person in our lives. So Solomon says, fear God and keep his commandments. Some of you remember the old hymn, trust and obey. Anybody remember that hymn? Trust and obey, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to what? Trust and obey. One more phrase. And we're done. Notice what he says in verse 13. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. It's interesting, in the original, the word duty is not found. Many times the translator is trying to come up with what it was that that Hebrew writer was saying at times would add words to add significance, but the word duty is not found. This is what Solomon says, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. This is the whole, not duty, this is the essence of we begin today with the question that Solomon asked in the very beginning. The very beginning of our study, chapter 1 and verse 3, Solomon says this, What does man gain by all of his toil under the sun? Here's what he's asking. What is life all about? As you and I sit back and try to figure out life, what is life all about? Where does life find its meaning? Why in the world did God place us on this planet anyways? Here's what I want you to get. Pursuing Jesus is the purpose of your existence. Pursuing Jesus is the purpose of your existence. Can you say that with me today? Say, pursuing Jesus is the purpose of my existence. Say it with me today. Pursuing Jesus is the purpose of my existence. One more time. Pursuing Jesus is the purpose of my existence. God placed you on this little planet. He placed me on this little planet. He placed us in the place in the solar system where oxygen abounds and where there's plenty of water and where life could be sustained. And he takes care of us and he loves us. And he does all of that. Why? Because he wants us to pursue him. And we have the tendency to chase after so many other things. And Solomon says, all of those other things are vanity. All of those other things are meaningless. Pursue me. Chase after me. You see, it doesn't matter what you have accomplished, how much money you have made. A life without Jesus is empty and void. The question as we end our series today is this, 
Do you know Jesus? Are you pursuing Jesus? I mean, do you really know him? He is so much better than money, fame, sex, or success. He is what makes life worth living. It was the church father, Augustine, that said this, because God made us for himself, our hearts are restless until they rest in him. (laughs) Is your heart resting in him today? Stand with me today with your head bowed and your eyes closed as we conclude our service this morning. Let me ask you a couple of really simple questions. First of all, do you know Jesus? By that I mean, I don't mean do you know of him, do you know how to spell his name, you know a couple of historical facts about him. Do you know him? Do you have a personal relationship with him? You see, he came to this earth, lived and died, paid the price of our our sins so that we might have a relationship with him. That relationship begins when I confess my sins. I realize that in of myself, I'm a sinner. I realize that my only hope is in him and I trust him as my personal Lord and Savior. If you have never done that today, man, we would invite you. We have counselors down front that would love to take the word of God and show you how you can know for sure that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. But I imagine I'm speaking to a large group of people who are already followers of him. Are you pursuing him? The whole gist of our series is this, the pursuit. What are you chasing after today? If you're not chasing after Jesus, you're chasing after the wrong thing. And I can think of no better time than today to say, God, help me to begin to seek after you, to begin to pursue you, to begin to chase after you. God, help me to do that. Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Lord, I pray that you would allow or help us to to allow the truth of the word of God to sink into our minds and sink into our hearts. God, may you be the object of our worship. May you be the object of our passion. May you be the object of our desire. May you be the purpose of our life. Help us to realize that the whole essence, purpose of our being, is to fear God and to keep his commandments. And obviously, we cannot do that ourselves. We can only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit of God that lives in us as we trust in Jesus Christ. So I pray that you would help us to do that this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.